And now the reading for today, which the theme is on the autobiography of a yogi. Early in their married life, my parents became disciples of a great master, Lahiri Mahashaya of Benares. This contact strengthened father's naturally ascetic temperament. Father first met Lahiri Mahashaya through Avinash Babu, an employee at the Gorakhpur office of the Bengal Nagpur Railway. Avinash instructed my young ears with engrossing tales of many Indian saints. He invariably concluded with a tribute to the superior glories of his own guru. Did you ever hear of the extraordinary circumstances under which your father became a disciple of Lahiri Mahashaya? It was on a lazy summer afternoon as Avinash and I sat together in the compound of my home that he put this intriguing question. I shook my head with a smile of anticipation. Years ago, before you were born, I asked my superior officer, your father, to give me a week's leave from my Gorakhpur duties in order to visit my guru in Benares. Your father ridiculed my plan. Are you going to become a religious fanatic, he inquired. Concentrate on your office work if you want to forge ahead. Sadly walking home along a woodland path that day, I met your father in a palaquin. He dismissed his servants, his servants and conveyance and fell into step beside me. Seeking to console me, he pointed out the advantages of striving for worldly success but I heard him listlessly. My heart was repeating, Lahiri Mahashaya, I cannot live without seeing you. Our path took us to the edge of a tranquil field where the rays of the late afternoon sun were still crowning the tall ripple of the wild grass. We paused in admiration. There in the field, only a few yards from us, the form of my great guru suddenly appeared. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employee. His voice was resonant in our astounded ears. He vanished as mysteriously as he had come. On my knees I was exclaiming, Lahiri Mahashaya, Lahiri Mahashaya. Your father was motionless with stupefaction for a few moments. Avinash, not only do I give you leave, but I give myself leave to start for Benares tomorrow. I must know this great Lahiri Mahashaya who is able to materialize himself at will in order to intercede for you. I will take my wife and ask this master to initiate us in his spiritual path. Will you guide us to him? Of course. Joy filled me at the miraculous answer to my prayer and the quick favorable turn of events. The next evening, your parents and I entrained for Benares. We took a horse cart the following day and then had to walk through narrow lanes to my guru's secluded home. Entering his little parlor, we bowed before the master and locked in his habitual lotus posture. He blinked his piercing eyes and leveled them on your father. Bhagavati, you are too hard on your employees. His words were the same as though he had used as those he had used two days before in the Gorakhpur field. He added, I am glad that you have allowed Avinash to visit me and that you and your wife have accompanied him. To their joy, he initiated your parents in the spiritual practice of Kriya Yoga. Your father and I, as brother disciples, have been close friends since the memorable day of the vision. Lahiri Mahashaya took a definite interest in your own birth. Your life shall surely be linked with his own. The Master's blessing never fails. So that is a very significant story for many reasons, but not the least of which is it is the first miracle that is mentioned in the autobiography of a yogi. And it takes place on page 8. And so, as you're marching through this book from this uh, great yoga master, and then suddenly, as Swamiji put it, Lahiri Mahashaya is materializing in a wheat field, suddenly you have to reflect if you have 
uh, questioning mind, certainly as I did, I had to just pause. Um, am I reading this right? Did Lahiri Mahashaya just walk by? No, he just materialized in the wheat field. Okay. And it, I, it was a challenge to my uh, sort of scientific mind, you could say. How is this possible? This was my first encounter with stories of miracles like this. And I couldn't believe that that actually happened. But I also couldn't believe that Yogananda would tell a lie. And so I was stuck with this apparent contradiction. And so, as sometimes we say at Ananda, I took this contradiction, I put it on a shelf and just said, okay, I'm going to let it rest there. I'm not going to decide one way or another. I'll just let it rest. Maybe after some time I can take it off the shelf and re-examine it. And so this is the blessing of the autobiography of a yogi, all of these miracles. It's also actually a challenge of the autobiography of a yogi to many readers. I had a friend who was from America and who I said, he said, what is it that you're doing with all this yoga meditation? I mean, what made you so keen all of a sudden? And I said, read Autobiography of a Yogi, you'll, you'll understand. And so he read it and he was trying, he was trying very hard. And he got to the point, of, if you've read the book recently, you'll remember there's the one story when um, Master and his boyhood friend Jitendra are running off to the Himalayas and then they get caught by the police and brought back to the station. And then the police officer says, you want to go find saints in the Himalayas. I met one right here that he had accidentally taken to be a criminal, a murderer who was actually uh, wanted, you know, and they were all chasing him and they called out to him and said, stop! And the saint just kept walking and so the policeman took his axe and cut the man's arm off. And then he turned and he said, I'm not the man you're looking for. And the police officer was horrified that he had injured anyone, but especially such a noble looking person. And the <laughs> saint said, it's okay, it was an easy mistake. And he picked up the arm that was severed and he just put it back in the stump and it stayed there. And he said, come see me in, in two days under that tree and just so you can see for yourself it's completely healed. And so the police officer went and came back and lo and behold there was no wound, nothing, no trace of anything. So my friend reading that story said, that's it, <laughs> I'm sorry. Even that, I, that's too much. I can't believe that. The funny thing is, because I was talking about these stories as a test also, is that in that same chapter, when you read further, Master makes this little reference. He says something about the miracles in a saint's life. And he said, these miracles didn't surprise me, nor, I hope, my readers who have been able to accompany me this far. And so even then you can see him saying, yeah, I know, I'm taking you through some pretty deep waters and I'm challenging your thoughts. Like one character said to him in the autobiography, not a character, but a person, when uh, Lahiri Mahashaya's great disciple Swami Pranabhananda, the saint with two bodies, appeared both to Master. You remember this story? Master went up to see him and his father had sent him to UC Swami Pranabhananda and I actually know, I want to offer a job to another gentleman who Swami, whom Swami Pranabhananda knows. So you, you will enjoy meeting him anyway, son, Yoganandaji's father said to him, and then also I can see if this will work out, this job offer. And so Master went to Swami Pranabhananda's room and just entered and Swami Pranabhananda said, Welcome Bhagavati's son. And he hadn't even been able to introduce himself, show the letter. He said, I will uh, contact this man you are looking for. And so <laughs> Master just thought, oh, okay. And so then they just meditated and he thought, you know, I'm sure on one level, Master tells the story from a human perspective, but of course as an avatar he had an infinite perspective the whole time. But at the same time, for our benefit, if nothing else, you can imagine him going sort of, 
when shall we call this man? <laughs> just, they just were sitting there meditating. And so and he started to become impatient. And so he, after, I mean, a half hour, an hour, I forget the amount of time, he turned and started to walk down the stairs. And then this man was coming up the stairs. And he said, are you Naresh Babu or whatever the name was? And he said, are you Bhagavati's son who's come to meet me? And he said, how could you possibly know? And he said, oh, Swami Pranabhananda, when I was at the temple, came to see me and said, Bhagavati's son is here, come with me. And so he seemed to, you know, just appear out of the crowd. So I followed him and even though he was wearing just these wooden chapels, he quickly outran me and I couldn't find him. So I came here. And Yogananda said, that's impossible. There's no way that could have happened. And the man said, I don't know what you're driving at. Of course I'm telling you the truth. And he said, I've been sitting here the whole time with Swami Pranabhananda who hasn't moved. And then this was the point I was making. The man saw Swami Pranabhananda and just said, you know, am I living in this materialistic age, this modern age of, you know, the present, or am I lost in the ancient time of miracles? This sort of new miraculous world that we have with all of its iPods and iPhones and droids, which are so fantastic, and they are, but still they seem to be the new miracle and they kind of in a way can certainly engage and entertain us. And yet miracles like Lahiri Mahashaya materializing in a wheat field can shake us to say, wait a minute, this is all Maya. And when you become a master, you have control over the Maya. Not, of course, for your own ends, because united with God, it's for God's ends. But still, let's not get too distracted. The nice thing about this story, too, is it's the moment when Bhagavati, Yoganandaji's father, realized there was more to life than what he was himself preaching. Get ahead in life, work hard, don't become a religious fanatic, all these things. And that one experience was enough to transform him. And each one of us has likely had an experience like that, whether we started out not interested in the spiritual path and suddenly became interested, or whether we were always interested but then found something that fueled our hunger, like Yoganandaji was eager to find God from his very birth, his earliest memories even of being a yogi in the past. And yet, still, he was constantly seeking until he found his guru. And then he was continuing saying, you must introduce me to God. And so, what I love about this story too is it's a reminder to us to think of those precious memories that brought us onto the spiritual path or that connected us with Yoganandaji, if Yogananda is your guru, those, that early time is a very special time. And it's very helpful, Yoganandaji even advised, to bring up those sweet memories and keep them precious and keep them alive because we remember those, the, the great hand of God reaching into our lives at that moment. It's also important to remember that someone else, I mean, uh, Bhagavati goes from criticizing his employee rather sternly and forbidding him to go see his guru to saying, can you please take me to Banaras? And so we never know just when things are at their worst, when Divine Mother is only testing us just to see how much we can take or just to see if we'll get the joke or if we will have a meltdown. Avinash was just unconsolable no matter what Bhagavati would say and say, listen, it's fine, don't worry about this. He just said, I've got to see my guru and I can't. And then circumstances changed. Sometimes again, Divine Mother is just playing a joke on us. One time Master played a joke on Swamiji. Swamiji and another disciple whose name was Norman, and Norman was a very strong man, they were digging a hole in uh, 29 palms, which is in Southern California. It's actually in the desert. And Master had a hermitage out there that no one knew about during his lifetime so that he could go and write, he could meditate, he could uh, dictate uh, uh, his books actually. And 
and not be disturbed by phone calls and visitors and all the things that the uh, life of a public person uh, attract. And so he asked Swamiji and Norman to dig this swimming pool. And so they were digging, you know, in the hot sun, in the desert, a big pit. And of course, there's nowhere else to put the sand piles, but just around the pit. So they had these huge mounds of sand in different places. And this would happen for many days. It took them, of course, to dig it. So at near the end, Master came out, as he came out every day and at different times, but he came and he said, these mounds don't look very attractive, do they? Let's, let's see if we can do something. Pick up that two by four. This, mind you, was at the time of their lunch, right when they had finished some hours of work and were pretty much wiped out. And he said, grab that two by four and you get on either end of it and hold it up to the sand pile and slowly move it back and forth to spread out the sand. And they did this first pile and you know, it's an awkward way. I mean, you know, you can imagine other ways to smooth the sand pile. And so they're doing this and they were just completely exhausted from just doing that sand pile and thinking, okay, but at least Swamiji said, we've shown that it worked. Master said, excellent, I would think it would work. Um, let's try that one over there. And so Swami and Norman went over to that one and were doing that pile too. And Master said, excellent. Uh, there's one in the back. And at this point, Norman was panting and, you know, from the strain. And Swamiji too was exhausted. And then he, Master said, okay, very good. Uh, that one there. And so then they did that one. And then he said, okay, and then there's this one. And Swamiji just put down the two by four and started laughing. And Master said, that's right, it's been a good show. Now go have your lunch. He was just testing, which way will you break? Will we break in the favor of contraction, of feeling sad, or will we break in the, in the direction of saying, okay, Divine Mother, I give up, it's all yours. And so keep that in mind, that in any instant, Divine Mother can shift things. And what do we do? when we're in a situation, Avinash's situation was regrettable that he couldn't see his guru when he wanted to. And sometimes that can feel like life and death. Sometimes maybe it is. But we also have other circumstances where it feels like all forces are allied against us. And Swamiji said, in such a situation, put out constant energy as much as you can in a positive direction. He said, ceaselessly, unceasingly put out positive, direct, positive energy in, a, in a, the opposite direction of what's coming at you. He said, only thus can you shift the tides of karma in your favor. And then in a different piece of counsel, he said, when you're in a, basically an impossible situation, do everything you can to succeed and everything you can to reconcile the uh, situation. And he said, and if it, that's one way you can shift it, or if you can't, then at least if it all, you know, if you fail or if it all falls apart, you will have the peace of mind knowing that you did every possible thing you could. And that find sometimes in a situation our test is not if you just try hard enough, it will work out the way you want. Sometimes our test is let's have it all not work out and see how you feel. Sometimes the test is an inner test. The outer circumstance maybe is a karma that we are just been dealt. And that's another thing too to keep in mind. Swamiji said he had a very difficult test when he was thrown out of SRF. He said it was the hardest test of my life. And he said, yet I felt later as if a great karmic burden had been removed from me. And sometimes that's the only consolation we can give ourselves is that I must have had a big karmic debt and it is now paid. The balance on that one is zero. And too bad, I wish I hadn't had that, but it's finished. And in that way we can move on. Because no one can do anything to us that isn't our karma to receive. I don't mean that in a heavy way, like, you know, someone smacks, oh, oh, it's my karma. Okay, no, go ahead, it's my karma. No, I don't mean it like that. But I mean, when something seems very unfair, one possible way to address our hearts 
is to say, well, I don't know what was going through that person's mind and there's whatever personal stuff there is, but on the cosmic level, sometimes it comforts me to think on the cosmic level, they couldn't, that couldn't have happened to me if it weren't my karma. Because if it wasn't my karma and they still did it to me, then, I mean, they must be more powerful than God. And I don't think they are. And so let me just own my part of it, even as innocent as I may feel. Let me see what I can internalize, what I can learn from that situation. There was a man I knew who growing up at Ananda, uh, he was a part of Ananda, not at Ananda village, but wherever he would go, people would get into fights all around him. No one would pick a fight with him. He would never be in the fight, but he would always witness fights or he would be walking right at the moment where some fellows started arguing or beating on each other or something. And he thought, this is strange. I keep happening to have this bad luck of walking into the fights. And, but he noticed no one else had this karma except him. And he began to think about it after it happened, I don't know, five, ten times. Just, hmm, maybe there's something in me that's, you know, uh, attracting this. And so he began meditating even more and thinking more about ahimsa and more about peacefulness in his heart. And then he noticed that there were no longer any fights around him. Sometimes it's not our karma to be in the middle of an, a struggle, but we still kind of have that around us. Maybe because our, our test is to learn how to be calm in the face of other people's struggle. To send peace, to send love, or to be unflappable, unmovable in ourselves despite what's going around. As Master said, you must learn to stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. That's a tall order. I mean, just even here, if the power and the water go out at the same time, it can feel like breaking worlds. <laughs> That's not breaking worlds. Even an earthquake is not breaking worlds. So, it's a tall order, and yet we can. Because we're not alone. We have the gurus, we have the sense of the divine in our hearts. And in meditation, we just feel that calmness. As uh, one of our friends in Bangalore, she was wanting to get Kriya Yoga, but she wasn't sure if she could and if she could meditate long enough each day. And she was also doing all of her exams at the same time uh, to finish her schooling and take a job. And she was just so worried. And she was speaking to another friend of ours from Ananda who had recently taken Kriya initiation. And she was talking to him about, but you know, because I'm thinking because if I don't get this mark, then I, even though I want that engineering job, I'm not sure. And my parents are saying it must be mechanical. And I want, but I like, you know, all of these different things. And she could tell at one point that he wasn't fully with her. <laughs> listening and all, to every single element of this. And she said, I mean, don't you worry like this too? And he said, you know, I used to. But he said, since practicing Kriya, that part of my mind has just turned off. I don't worry as much anymore. And it isn't that he was less conscientious or that he was uh, less focused. In fact, of course, he was more focused. Because how much of the time does worrying about something distract us from just doing whatever is in front of us? So that inspired her and she said, okay, well, I do want, I, I think I want God, but I definitely want peace from all this worry. And so she ended up working towards Kriya initiation and finally taking it. So never underestimate. I'm sure the, the God's uh, potential to reach right into our lives and grab us. I'm sure Bhagavati, waking up that morning, did not think, okay, I think I'll see a saint today in a wheat field. God just comes like that. But Bhagavati must have worked hard as a yogi in previous lives to attract the blessing of his guru coming to him. When the guru came and chastised him and said, you are too hard on your employee, he wasn't saying it just so Abhinash could get to come and visit him. He wasn't even saying it because he wanted... Bhagavati to come visit him, he said it out of concern for Bhagavati. Come on, it's time to get back to work. Time to get back on the spiritual path. And so look for Divine Mother whispering to you 
in Matt Swami said, sometimes you can even hear in the bark of a dog. He said, I asked, Divine Mother, are you speaking through that dog? What are you trying to say? Through the honking of the horns. Sometimes the horns sound irritated. Sometimes they sound cheerful. Happy little horns. It's just like, what is Divine Mother saying to us through the environment? And then, of course, in our hearts in meditation. God bless you. He was talking about 29 palms where Swamiji helped build the pool in uh, California. It's in the desert. And when we lived in Los Angeles, we thought, let's go find it. And it's not advertised where it is. So we had a little adventure. We were with actually Nai Swami's Haridas and Roma. They were also in Southern California uh, in charge of a center near us. And so we all got in the car and went to that area and looked up uh, the, at the planning commission that was there to look up that property to find out where it was. So we went there, we looked on all these maps, we found the property, we, but we couldn't quite tell where it was in reference to the other houses that might be on that road. So we got to the road, we drove down it, and we thought, well, we don't know which road this might be, but let's try and find it. So we slowly drove past each car, meditating, in, in a meditative state. Of course, the driver <laughs> wasn't meditating, but the rest of us were just feeling. And then it would suddenly stop. This has to be it. And it was just pouring out the vibrations of Master. You could just feel the meditative energy there. You could feel how powerful it was. We still didn't know if it was, but we just said, this has to be it. So we thought, let's see if there's the pool in the backyard. So you could get to a trail that went behind all the houses. In the desert, uh, you know, no trees hardly, just rocks and sand, kind of like Rajasthan. And so when you're walking, it, it's no mystery as to where behind the houses are. You can see behind the houses from the front of the houses because it's just sand and rock. So we're walking behind and no pools until we get to that one house. And then there was the pool in the backyard. We finally got to see what Swamiji was speaking about in his book, The New Path. I don't know if you've read that, but it's a wonderful book to read. And he describes this whole time of when he was with Yogananda Ji in the, at the 29 Palms re retreat. So we got to see the pool, and for us that confirmed that that was the right place. We talked to Swamiji later about it, and he said, yes, that was it. And uh, so anyway, I wanted to share that story because it was so precious to be able to be there in America, in especially Los Angeles and the surrounding area. There are many places of pilgrimage there. And then what's so beautiful is then here in India, we have the places of pilgrimage in Kolkata. Swami, or Master's uh, childhood home, then around the corner is Tulsi Bose's home, who, uh, his childhood friend, and um, there's Sarampur and uh, Puri, and so there's all these places. We can visit Sri Yukteswar's ashram. You can visit the Bodhi tree where, you know, Babaji appeared, and just everything is there. So it's a wonderful place to go. Then, of course, Raniket, where Babaji's cave is. We've, we've been on that pilgrimage as well. So anyway, it's, we, we have wonderful places of pilgrimages here in South um, India, Dharmaraj and I are looking forward to visiting so many places. We've been to Tiruvanna Malai, but then also up north. And at some point, we're going to um, organize a pilgrimage for anyone who wants to come. We can all go together. And then also, uh, a new retreat has happened. It's up right near the Himalayas, near Ranakhet, Nanital. And we might combine a Babaji cave trip with this that someone has a retreat center up there that they want dedicated for Ananda people. And so we can all go up there, and um, if you haven't been to Ranakhet and that area, you know, you're just on the edge of one cliff, and right there are all the 
the Himalayas, and it's just a beautiful experience. So these are things we have um, to look forward to uh, in spending this time together.